Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I want to uh, begin by thanking some of the prior st uh, speakers for providing a background for some of what I'd be telling you about. I'm going to start by giving you a very brief overview about mirror neurons. Uh, I suspect most of you are familiar with them. They've received quite a bit of uh, media attention. Uh, mirror neurons are motor neurons that display a very a peculiar property of, of firing, both when uh, a person uh, executes and actions, and also when the, uh, the person observed the same action being uh, performed by others. Um, they were first discovered serendipitously, actually, in the macaque monkey in uh, two different regions. Both, um, you can see here a frontal region as well as a, a later uh, in a parietal area. And uh, importantly, this uh, work done in this uh, line of research showed that this mirror neurons have a, a pattern of responding not just to goal-directed actions like you've seen before, reaching for a peanut and, or uh, for a cup or for whatnot, but also to respond to intransitive actions that are more important for social communications. And what you see here is a, a very interesting pictures of a, a monkey that was actually responding to the same uh, filative lip smacking gesture done by a human. So uh, this um, system has been studied, studied in human quite extensively and uh, using a variety of different techniques uh, researchers have identified some mirror-related activities in the human homologues of the same regions where the mirror neurons were first discovered in the monkeys. Now, what's important is that the system has been linked not just to action understanding, but also to the process of imitation that uh, Andy Meltz have talked to you about, and also this, uh, in, the notion of understanding what's behind other people's action, that is their intentions. For, so for instance, in a study um, that was done by some uh, colleagues at UCLA, you see here that um, the people in the scanner were actually looking at a hand coming in and performing the exact same action of reaching for that mug. But nevertheless, the brain res responded quite differently to those same actions based on the context. In this case, one can draw the inference and the person is reaching in order to drink because the cup is full and in this context, one may perhaps make, draw the inference that the person is uh, reaching for the same cup, but to just clean up after breakfast. Interestingly, this kind of differential response to the same action being performed, but with different intention, has also been observed in monkeys during single cell recordings. Now, of course, in humans, uh, you cannot just go about implanting electrodes in a person's brain for the sake of research. And so for a while, it wasn't exactly clear that what we were observing using a variety of imaging techniques, such as fMRI or transcranial ma magnetic stimulation or EEG, uh, whether we were actually tapping into the exact same system that had been previously identified in the monkeys. Well, uh, thankfully, we now have actually um, been able to do so by capitalizing or I, I'm it's not a word that I want to use, use here because this were actually patients uh, that were undergoing surgery and they had electrodes implanted in their cortex because of that. But it allowed for a tremendous opportunity for researchers to actually investigate this um, neurons in the human brain. And so, I mean, this is kind of like a dense slide, but I hope you can quickly eyeball that there are some similarities in the firing of single neurons, both when the person was observing, uh, both uh, simple hand action, but also facial expression like frowning and smiling, and when they were actually ex executing uh, those same movements. So a second important thing, other than proving that this, the system, this mirror neurons are actually existing in the, in the human brain, is that these recordings were not done in the exact same two regions where mirror neurons had been discovered in the monkeys. Because you, obviously, the, where the electrodes had been implanted depended, depended on the particular patient and the surgery they were going to have to do. So these neurons uh, that you see the recordings here were actually found outside these areas, which is consistent with a, a an emerging view that mirroring is not really a peculiar function of the motor system, but rather that it's a much more pervasive and common phenomenon whereby vicarious activity, so in our brain, the firing uh, of neurons in our brain, may also code others' emotion as well as their perception and sensation. 
The system has been implicated in social cognition, and again, some like Victorio Galese argue that this may actually be the neural mechanism that may provide a substrate for what uh, Andy Meltzer talked to you about, that is this like me analogy between self and others, that it's fundamental for the development of social cognition and for, the, uh, for human development. So there have been a variety of neuroimaging studies that have imp further implicated the system in, so in the social emotional domain, again, moving away from just simple action understanding. And in the realm of autism, there are now some 30 and more independent studies looking at uh, the functioning of this system in individuals with autism, but also in the general population, but relating the functioning of the system to uh, the presence of autistic traits. As we know, autism is a, it's a continuum, and so you can actually not have a diagnosis, and but yet show some traits and qualities that are similar to what you observe in individuals who do receive a diagnosis. So um, I cannot, you know, even attempt to summarize, but I mean, just suffice to say that this has uh, been found using a variety of techniques, and uh, while there are some exceptions, uh, I think that overall the overwhelming evidence supports the notion that the system is some, it, it's altered in individuals with autism. Now I'm going to show you uh, some data that we have collected uh, several years ago in a task where uh, for the first time we looked at children diagnosed uh, with autism as they uh, perform two very simple basic tasks while in the scanner. Um, one, at one point where they were asked to just watch, simply look at the expression that they saw on each face. And in a second task they were also asked to make the same expression that they saw on, on those faces. What we have seen here, and by the way, TD stands for typically developing children, was that there were some sharp differences in the level of activities, I mean the red blobs, that we observed in the typically developing children as compared to the children with autism. You possibly also see some common areas of activity. These are visual areas showing that uh, both groups of children were paying attention to what we presented them with. And also you see some nice activity in, in the motor region. So this was the imitation task and so we knew that actually all children were performing the task. But this region here, which is that frontal homologs of, of the area where uh, mirror neurons were first uh, identified in monkeys, uh, did not show any significant activities in the two group. And when we compared them directly, we also see that the difference was statistically significant. Okay, uh, interestingly in this study, we also found that while at the group level, there was no significant activity here. If we actually examine activity in those regions, regions is a function of, social, of the severity of the symptoms. We found that children that showed less severe impairment tended to have more activity in this region, and conversely, the one that showed the least amount of activity in the region were the one that showed the most profound deficit in the social domains. Interestingly, we found these sharp differences in what the brain uh, did, even if, as you can tell from just looking at the picture of this child, every single child did a pretty good job at mimicking those uh, emotional expressions. And I think that you can see that just by looking at these pictures. So how did they do that? Well, the brain, the brain uh, can accomplish the same task, relying on different mechanisms. And indeed, we found that uh, children with autism in our study showed greater activity in two regions in the visual association cortex and also in an attentional parietal areas, which suggested that they were nevertheless able to accomplish that task of imitating the emotional expression despite a lack of an automatic mirroring by paying additional attention to what they were seeing and matching it with their, uh, to their own um, motor um, act. We recently replicated this study, uh, which was initially done in a relatively small sample, in a much larger sample of children with, uh, again, autism. And as you, what you see here um, is the region, again, the frontal mirror, uh, neuron regions, uh, that sh where we found a very robust negative correlation between activity and symptom severity. So what you see plotted here uh, is symptom severity as defined based on the autism diagnostic observation schedule, which is one of the golden uh, standards uh, in uh, assessing and uh, reliability of a diagnosis in autism. And uh, what you see here were children in, in red, were the children that only met 
criteria for autism based on the autism diagnostic interview. Something that is done with the parents that again goes back to how your child behave or what were some of the initial symptoms. So it's quite a uh, um, heavily weighted on the early initial stages of development. Here you see children that were on the spectrum uh, based on this autism diagnostic observation schedule. And here were the children that actually got a diagnosis of full autism. So what differentiates these three groups, these are children that show less impairment. If you, by the ADOS, the again, this uh, autism diagnostic observation schedule, they would not have autism. But based on their whole history, they still met criteria for, for a clinical diagnosis. Then you have children that were somewhat um, imp more impaired, they had an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis based on this instrument. And here were the children that came out with a full diagnosis. And those were the one that was most uh, impacted. And here I want to briefly just show you uh, that when we broke, uh, when we looked at the pattern of activity uh, as we have done in the first study, we replicate the same pattern. But importantly, when we split this larger sample of, uh, of uh, children that had a diagnosis into the groups that actually did have a met criteria for full autism, we see uh, that the difference becomes even sharper. So these are larger areas that show differences between this group of children and children with typic uh, the, uh, typically developing controls. But when we looked at that group of children that either met criteria for autism only based on the interviews with the parents, or that came up on the spectrum only, not full autism, then you see that those differences were sharply reduced and they actually would have not survived some of the uh, standards that we typically subject to our neuroimaging uh, data. So which, you know, in, in, in essence, this some, what I'm trying to, uh, the point I'm trying to drive at here is that subtle differences in the sample characteristics uh, across studies may actually impact, um, uh, may have an uh, may impact whether or not we are gonna, you're going to see uh, findings replicate across studies. But symptom severity is not the only thing that modulate uh, responsivity of this system. And uh, in an, for instance, in another study, they found that familiarity, the person that you are observing or that you are to imitate, may also play a role. And what they've done here using EEG, mu suppression, what they've done was uh, having children looking at actions that were either performed by themselves or by a familiar other, or by complete strangers. And when you're looking at controls, this shows a little bit less of a response uh, to uh, complete strangers, but I mean, they nevertheless didn't show a response in the predicted direction across the board. Whereas in individuals with autism, they had very similar responses when they were observing their own arms and hands performing that action. So they were mirroring if they were mirroring themselves, if you will, but they show virtually no response when they were seeing the actions performed by a stranger. So there is an important modulation because somehow it relates to what Andy Meltzer was telling you about this notion that you, we typically, neurotypical individual, uh, think of others as being like me, like, like themselves. Um, we have done in my lab, I mean, another uh, re graduate students did a study where we looked at uh, the self uh, versus other representation more directly. And we've done that by clever paradigm where we took pictures of each individual participant. These are sample pictures, they're not real uh, subjects. And then an unfamiliar others, and we created morphs. So by the, the, the difference here is that there are two people and then by 20% increments, you morph this person into the other face. And what we asked the kid, the participant in the scanner was just to push a button where they could see themselves and push another button if they saw more the other person, okay? So it was a, a very uh, simple task. And when you are, um, what you're seeing here is that the responses where they were saying, I see myself, in this picture were remarkably similar. You see a lot of orange, which means that both the children that had an autism spectrum diagnosis as well as the children um, that were neurotypicals show this pattern of activity. But when you're actually looking at the activity associated with their judgment that they were no longer seeing themselves, they were seeing now more of the other person, 
the typically developing uh, children nevertheless activated the very similar frontal region, this mirror regions, that they also activate where they were looking at pictures of others. But you see very little orange in this frontal regions because the children with an autism diagnosis no longer responded in the same way. Again, this is be another indication that was this failure to map, to use the same neural circuitry to map um, uh, others onto your own representation. Okay. So we have also looked at we also looked at the same mechanism in a, large, a sample of neurotypical individuals looking at interpersonal competence and empathy. So we've already shown evidence that in kids with autism, you have a relationship between uh, activity in this mirroring circuitry and uh, their uh, social uh, impairments. And we wanted to see, does that apply also to uh, neurotypical individuals? And lo and behold, we didn't find fact that that was the case. So these are neurotypical children. We got their parental reports that assess their overall interpersonal competence. The parents fill out a questionnaire asking, is uh, my kids get along with others? Is it liked, uh, gets in troubles a lot, and so on and so forth. And, uh, as, uh, and we related this measurement to the pattern of brain activity when these children were viewing those facial, emotional, and expressions, and we found strong correlation. So the kids that had the better interpersonal skills that the parents rated as being better or interacting with others were the ones that show the most activity, both in the mirroring regions, but also in this uh, limbic areas, the amygdala, which is a center important for processing emotion. So these were the children that it, what we're trying to point out here is this notion that by virtue of being able to understand what, how others uh, feel, you may be overall at a, at a benefit in terms uh, of your um, social relationships. And likewise, when we compare the children's tendency to empathize with others, we did find, again, the same kind of relationship with stronger activity in the mirroring regions and also in the um, emotional circuitry for children that had better empathizing skills. This is interesting because we know, have known for quite some time that there is a, a great uh, level of, uh, there is a strong relationship between this positional empathy, the tendency to empathize with others, and the so-called chameleon effect, which is the, the tendency to mimic what others are doing. And, and this is one just uh, uh, an interesting picture. I mean, I guess I should update it with one from Obama. But the point is that it hammers in a point, and that is that we, studies after studies, behavioral studies have shown that we tend to mimic, to imitate people that we like. And very interestingly, and perhaps less uh, stressed, that's often pointed out, is that we also tend to like more people who imitate us the most. These are all implicit, spontaneous mechanisms. So imitation, uh, it's as Andy Meltzer had told you before, it's critically important and for learning about the world and others, but it also seems to have this a very um, important role, and that is to develop affiliative behavior. Okay, um, one of the things that um, we have now evidence of is, is actually that this spontaneous tendency to mimic others, so this facial mimicry reflects uh, this spontaneous uh, automatic process whereby every time we talk and interact with others, we tend to mimic their facial expression and ultimately we may also feel the way they're feeling. And uh, what the studies show that is actually uh, the level to which you mimic spontaneously another person's emotional expression or emotion relates to the reward value of the stimulus. So we are linking together this imitation, spontaneous imitation and uh, a feeling uh, of, of, of reward. So it is rewarding. Now, there's also now evidence that directly link this process of facial mimicry to activity in this mirroring circuits that I've been uh, telling you about, and I will not have time to go over it, but we also have uh, evidence that in children with autism, the reward circuitry seems to be hyper-responsive when it comes to social rewards. So. We all know social rewards are extremely important, and in this study we have found that there was reduced responses in this reward circuitry um, to social rewards that were simply smiling faces, letting children know that they guessed right or wrong in a task. 
So what are the implications uh, for our understanding of the human origins? Um, well, as I said from the start, mirror neurons have been discovered in monkeys and they've actually been discovered in other species, including birds. So it's not that mirror neurons are, mirror neurons are what makes us uh, humans or they're uh, unique about us. Um, although some people, uh, Michael Arbib, I don't know if he's in the audience, uh, have argued that mirror neurons may actually have played a role in the evolution of language. I will not be the person uh, to you know, push uh, the case, I would leave that to him. But uh, I think I, I hope I convey to you that this is an important system uh, where it comes to empathy and uh, imitation. Now, both empathic behavior and prosocial behavior, as well as imitation, have been observed in other primates. But the extent to which humans imitate and uh, empathize with others, I think it's of a completely different uh, nature and uh, I think that important question for the future are actually to address this and to understand why is imitation so more pervasive in humans? And uh, what may have fostered this increased motivation to be like others? So uh, there are two sides of, of, the, you know, of an important coin, which is like we learn a lot by this like me analogy, but at the same time, we also have this drive to be like others. And I think that those are two key questions to be answered. And we're beginning now to explore the relationship between this mirroring mechanism that may subserve imitation and the reward mechanism. So we also, I think, should address this notion uh, of how mirroring mechanism may relate to theory of mind abilities. The notion here is, as humans, uh, because we have language, we are capable of uh, doing much more than mirror neurons or a mirror neuron system can allow us to do. But nevertheless, can you have this higher level, it's an important question, can you have this higher level to your mind abilities if you're not constantly fed this more basic information about how other people feel, what they may be thinking, why are they doing what they're doing? And uh, lastly, at a more applied level, going back to Karen Pierce's talk, can we, one of the critical questions is, uh, can we improve developmental outcome for children uh, with an ASD diagnosis with early behavioral intervention that may actually target this circuitry, both this mirroring and this reward mechanism. And uh, there is a growing body of uh, research that shows that actually this may work. And with that, I thank you because I'm out of time. Thank you.